Uh, I do have some disclosures here as, thank God, we have interest in a pipeline for such a horrific, disabling, and demoralizing condition. Uh, and so I think we need more of these, but I'll talk about my experiences and what you can do to better control these patients. Um, so there are multiple phases of HS, not as much as some of the more heterogeneous diseases like AD, but I think one of the problems here is that this mimics something so common, which are cutaneous infections. And so because of that, this is often missed or misdirected for many years, and that can have tremendous consequences. I think HS is one of those great examples of truly translational science at its best. We still have a lot to learn, but there is a lot of excitement in terms of our understanding of the immune dysregulation that is driving disease, that is causing what looks like, oh, a boil, as our patients say, but there's a lot more going off beneath the surface that is turning that inflammation on and keeping it on over time. Without a strong understanding of how this disease manifests at the immunologic level, we're never gonna get a handle on it. And I do agree, cutting does make a big difference, and we'll talk about it, but it's not one or the other. You need to give proper respect to the immunology to then even be able to cut this whole problem out. Being a systemic inflammatory disease, just like every disease you've probably heard about today, there are risks for comorbidities. Uh, this was a paper actually pretty relatively old at this point, um, and I say I know that because the first author was one of the first residents to graduate from GW during her fellowship year uh, at the Brigham, um, but they showed that just like psoriasis, now with atopic derm, even rosacea and other diseases, lots of comorbidity potential. You will note that inflammatory bowel disease is not on this list, not because it's not associated, because it was like, it obviously is, so let's not even look at it. Other things to think about with comorbidities or resulting disease, just like I mentioned with DLE, squamous cell carcinoma can evolve in chronic inflammatory lesions. And this makes sense. Think about the marginal ulcer, that ulcer that just does not close, it grows, and it's more than just an ulcer. It turns into uh, a, a non-melanoma skin cancer. And these patients are at higher risk for that, especially in the uh, kind of genital area or perianal area. So because we really appreciate and have digested this association, it's actually recommended to ask patients about this, to screen for metabolic syndrome. And I would say with some of these patients, you can walk in and you already have a good sense that there's something metabolic -y going on. On the flip side, don't get tunnel vision. Um, I've heard actually even from uh, an organization called HS Connect, which is a patient-facing organization, that there is some biasing that this thought that, oh, HS is the disease just for obese women and black women at that. Nope, this condition does not discriminate. You can be stick thin and still have hydranitis. But because we know that these risks exist, we should be screening for metabolic syndrome, hormone abnormalities, but also from the impact of disease, depression, anxiety, that could be secondary or even driven by the disease itself as interleukin-1 beta, one of the key cytokines, can cross the broad-band barrier and affect mentation and how one thinks or feels. I alluded to this gap because this just looks like an infection and these patients bounce around from the ER, primary care, infectious disease, OBGYN, they, it gets missed. There's not continuity. So one of the charges I give to you, make it known you take care of these patients. Make it known what this is. And I would argue that because of those pipelines because we have an FDA approved systemic agent that has actually changed the narrative and patients are learning about this because industry is invested. And that's very often the case with many diseases. But we have to change these numbers. Time of onset to diagnosis, seven to 10 years, that is BS. We gotta do better. And the good news is people are paying attention, not just industry, but you out there, our colleagues. Um, there are consensus statements coming out. This is one that was just published in the JDD. Uh, from a symposium of experts in the area, and there's certainly more coming as well. So I'm gonna spend the remainder of the time focusing on management. And very much like atopic dermatitis, there are things you're gonna do no matter what is going on, no matter what phenotype or how bad it is. First off, you're gonna educate about what this is, what it isn't. It is not the patient's fault. You gotta say it. I've had patients cry over that. They think that they're dirty 
they're obese, they're wearing tight clothing, that's why it happens. Some of the things may exacerbate, it is not their fault. We wanna talk about diet and exercise. Uh, because we are what we eat. I'm going to use that line tomorrow when I talk about acne and diet. And we heard from Dr. Armstrong about psoriasis and diet. No question, diet can contribute to disease. But on the flip side, be clear, changing your diet is not going to be a cure. It's almost unfair, right? Like you misbehave and eat badly, your disease gets worse. You eat well, you exercise, your disease is at baseline. But that's the reality. That's why I say, I say to my patients. I mean, do I have to really argue why I have to stop smoking? Just simply got to do it. And think of things that you can remove, like friction, heat, things that you can remove from the environment that can limit exacerbation. So these are for every patient. Look at the med list. There are lots of things that exacerbate disease. Obviously, hormonal therapies can sometimes do it. Uh, the Mirena IUD, or hormonal, hormone-eluting IUDs, can absolutely worsen HS, acne, androgenic alopecia, sebderm. So it's important to know, same with the depot. Um, lithium can also do it as well. Stress, ha, who doesn't have that? Uh, and friction as well. So starting to get immunomodulators, and I think uh, Dr. Rosen teed this up nicely. Zinc can do a lot of cool things. And definitely different doses, it does different things. It is an immunomodulator, no question. And actually, when you think about you know, kind of rare diseases, like epidermal dysplasia bruciformis, it's so the hereditary form is associated with improper zinc transfer. So zinc does a lot of cool stuff. And so it can be important for immunomodulation, maybe wound healing, same with vitamin C. So all my HS patients, more than just maybe one little ditzel, is getting put on the supplementation. Also of note, it's important to think about dosing, but also combining with copper, and that limits some of the side effects. There's evidence that these patients are inherently zinc deficient. A couple of studies showing this. Um, and beyond even zinc deficiency, also low vitamin D, maybe even some others. So something to think about in terms of, I'm not saying screen every HS patient for vitamin levels. That would be a huge drain on the system. I would just think to yourself, well, maybe they are deficient. It's easy enough to supplement if it's appropriate. We do have a lot of, and in keeping with the last talk theme, off-label options, and I love off-label therapies. I think it's one of the most fun things we get to do in marrying the science with the disease and the MOA. Uh, but mostly what we do is off-label antibiotics, corticosteroids, retinoids, antimal therapies, and of course, most, most urgently needed but interesting to use are the, the, the biologics. So one thing, no matter what you do, whatever you're comfortable with, the way, and this is actually, Dr. Rose brought this up as well, there's also, all right, this is how you start, this is what you use. How do you know when to switch? How do you know when to stop? So these are questions I ask. You know, in assessing four to five months in whatever we're doing, are you getting new spots, brand new spots? If the answer is yes, okay, we're doing something different. Are they staying in the same area, but nothing else new is coming? It's just kind of, you're stabilized. That's when you start to think about surgery. Uh, I use a lot of intralesal Kenalog. Do not fear Kenalog. You've got to go higher. If you're doing your classic AA or you know, even in intralesional uh, acneiform papule, like 2.5, ain't going to cut it. I do 10 and higher. Load them up. It actually makes a huge difference and will recall, allow for some relief. Antibiotics have been used for a long time, yet none are actually approved. And the data we've had, even until recently, and even now, is very limited, yet we hang our hat on this. So one thought is, if we clear the flora, which is inappropriately instigating immune response, it will inhibit that immune response. But we also know a lot of our antibiotics have anti-inflammatory properties, especially we know a lot about the tetracycline class because of their development for acne and rosacea and other diseases. Clindorifampin is one of my go-tos, though it can have a, a negative impact on the stomach. It can also be fun at parties because it turns secretions orange. Please tell patients about that, especially contact wearers. Um, also know rifampin will accelerate the metabolism of oral contraceptives. You do not want to mess with that. Trust me, that would not end well. So, but I think there's, of all the evidence we have, the most is for this combination, 300 twice a day of each. Yet, most people go for tetracyclines. They go for doxy, even though the data is very limited. There was a recent study, I will say, that I don't cite here, that was better than we had before, but actually the original study was comparing doxy to topical clinda and they were analogous, yet that's our first go-to. So I think we have to think about the evidence, but realize there's not a lot. The end in these studies is maybe double digits, just scratching, triple, 
Um, but there's a lot you can play with here to try out. Dapzone is kind of resurfacing here. I never really used it. Occasionally I will employ it for a couple patients. Definitely not a first line for me, but this was a nice study looking at the efficacy using a validated research tool to look at that efficacy. Andromodal therapies, I use a ton of this. You heard about spironolactone, I give this out. Not as much as, actually take that back, I'll say not as much as hydroxychloroquine, but that would be really weird because we use spironolactone for everything, right? Acne, hair loss, really bad septerm, absolutely HS. Um, for postmenopausal women, I will give them finasteride or dutasteride, and men, of course, I'll give finasteride. And we actually have data. Um, Alyssa Kimball's group actually did a nice study showing that even monotherapy of spironolactone works. So this is getting on board, and that goes with the mentality of it's not one or the other, it's kitchen sink time. You're dumping everything we can within reason on the patient at once to try to get them better. Retinoids, I find, for more advanced disease, early two and three, they don't really work. Where I think they're useful is if you catch them early, which I know is like finding the Loch Ness Monster, but you do every so often. I'm seeing more of that thanks to all the marketing out there. If you catch them early and you hit them really hard and you treat to at least two months clearance after hitting that 200, 220 mg per kg uh, gold dose, maybe even a little higher, like 250, I find you can push them into remission. That's the only place I find this really effective, and it's more isotret than acetretin. And I find the most effective for more the follicular subtype, as depicted here, versus more classic uh, intertriginous disease. Systemic steroids could be a great crutch. You know, when I have someone who like, can't even lift their arm, they can't sit, they're miserable, I'm more like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do spirulactone and adalimumab, those things take a long time to work. Those patients are dying on the inside. They need relief, and 0.5 to 1 mg per kg definitely will give them a relief. Sometimes I'll even give like just a pulse of 60 to 80 for three days. That just takes the edge off, but also be mindful not to overdo it with steroids over time. All right, let's get into the biologics. It is an outcome, it is a control, it is not a cure. And it's very important that if we get you on this, you're doing better, it will come back if you stop it. That's where surgery could potentially um, kind of disregard what you're saying because if you do it right, and they're calm, you may prevent disease recurrence. Um, also of note in the world of COVID, and this is true in psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, that managing a chronic inflammatory disease with a biologic actually reduces bad outcomes versus promotes bad outcomes. And it makes sense. Why are they having bad outcomes in COVID? It's because of the exuberant immune response. It's not the virus, it's how our immune system responds. It's like sepsis. It's the inflammatory response that kills people. And so mitigating that in someone who has a, an overreactive immune response is gonna be very important. All right, so TNF-alpha has been the prime target to date. Um, it's been shown in small studies, there's higher levels of TNF-alpha, which is kind of a ubiquitous inflammatory cytokine. Um, early on, you know, it started with infliximab, some nice data using kind of, you know, a range of doses, five to 10 mg per kg with some efficacy. Um, you know, in terms of where we are with infliximab, and I'm following this, this is from the Einstein group, showing that higher dose with greater frequency, you get better outcomes, I completely agree. I'm starting my patients on seven and a half mg per kg per infusion, and depending on severity, it's every four to six weeks. Obviously you need an infusion center to do this, but I do find that the higher doses absolutely work better, and it's very patient specific because it's weight based. Um, if interested, I did a great interview with Dr. Cohen, who's the senior author on that paper and that study, and he kind of walks through how to do the infliximab. Um, also in patients who develop uh, in, in, in neutralizing antibodies, there is evidence that low-dose methotrexate can help prevent that. I don't think methotrexate works well to treat disease. This is more to prevent uh, uh, treatment resistance. Uh, Adalimumab has been the you know, kid on the block for quite some time. FDA approved, uh, going to the FDA trial, showing anywhere from 42 to 59% of patients uh, meeting their primary outcome. Realize the data is like spaced out because in Pioneer 2, patients could be on antibiotics or if they were already on them, and that to me mirrors real life. So I look at Pioneer 2 as what's more realistic uh, with respect to outcomes. Open label extension, this is actually an old paper at this point, you know, 2018, so it's been out for some time. When it works, it continues working, which I think is nice. And so this is one example, a patient who had really severe disease, just on adalimumab, spironolactone for a year, so well controlled. And so we sent her to surgery, and these are the outcomes. 
All right, now this is where we start going more off label uh, again, um, where sometimes a one size fits all doesn't work. And so that 80 milligrams, uh, now it's, you do it actually every other week, um, you can make it easier in terms of dosing. Sometimes it's not enough. And so dose escalation is needed, but how do you get it covered? Publish, please, for the love of God, publish your findings because that's what you submit to the insurance to argue why you need higher dose frequency. And then now we're really, we're really going off when it comes to off-label. We're the off-label bandits. Um, I feel like I use that term a lot, but it's true. And I mean it in a good way. We're not the bad guys. We're, we're the good bandits. There's such a thing. I'll have to re revisit that later on. I'll take that offline. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, indications for kids. There aren't really. I mean, so Adalimab is approved for 12 and up. Um, but beyond that, if we're thinking about, you know, off-label biologics, you know, we're really going uh, really off there when it comes to even TNF-alpha below 12 or some of the other, uh, other biologics. But we know, we've seen that they're safe and they can certainly work. And finally, as I mentioned, we do have a pipeline, a lot of things in the mix, small molecule inhibitors, some of which you've heard about uh, in the last couple days, biologics as well, and label extensions of established biologics. Secukinumab has been looked at actually in clinical trials now of a couple patients on it. It could be hit or miss. There are even some reports of a paradoxical worsening as with so many things in dermatology. Um, Usikinumab, I do use, um, I have a couple patients on it currently. Um, this is some nice data and really kind of diving into different metrics to follow for success. However, the psoriasis dosing, I don't find work. I feel like you have to do the higher dose of the 90 um, every four weeks, which could be very difficult to get covered. A premolast, so there's a bunch of different case reports and even small studies showing FSK with a premolast. Um, and realize HS and psoriasis are allowed to happen in the same patient, right? It's very similar, but also dissimilar pathways in the immune system. So, you know, treating two diseases with one drug has been looked at and there's some evidence for efficacy. Um, Look at Perdalumab, IL-17 receptor blocker, small study, very impressive outcomes. Some of the best we've seen yet, um, granted a small study. And then on the horizon, hopefully not too far off, miles away horizon, um, is a, another, another drug that will block more than the typical IL-17s with really nice evidence supporting its use. We just need to get our hands on it. So I would argue HS is hopping, finally. And I feel like I say that about so many diseases that like, like, oh, why does psoriasis get all the attention? Why is it the cool kid? Atopic derm needs it. Okay, about derm definitely has it now. HS, I think, is finally getting it too. Um, and all these diseases carry different risks and burden, but I think we have an exciting time ahead of us when it comes to hydratinitis. But before we get these label extensions, before we get these approvals, you have tools in your armament that you can already use. You know, Dr. Rosen mentioned, sample it up. I agree, samples can be the, a difference between night and day for these patients. You know, dose escalation, can they get approved for one indication? And then you're adding on with a supplement of samples. So I think the biggest thing, and this, I like circling back to even my kind of pearls talk, get creative with these patients, because we have literally one drug approved for this disease that affects maybe upwards 3% of the US population. So we really need to get creative and use the tools we have and uh, definitely get comfortable being that off-label bandit. So final pointers, combination synergistic therapies are key. Throw that kitchen sink at them. And, and I didn't really touch upon this, it can be a team-based approach. We mentioned surgery, but these patients may have issues with, OB, you know, from an OBGYN perspective, urology perspective, certainly tagging your friends across the aisle can be helpful in managing these patients. I think that's it. Thank you so much.